Welcome to the Head Hunter Hideout, everybody. I am super excited this week. We have a great guest, and we also have another big announcement. We have a new sponsor for the podcast. Our new sponsor is Volcanic, so thanks so much, Volcanic. Uh, today, we have Jeff K. I know a lot of people have messaged me excited about this episode. If you don't know who Jeff is, Jeff is the co-CEO of K. Bassman International, and they are one of the biggest single-site recruitment firms in the U.S., I, I, they might even be the biggest. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure they're one of the largest, though. And he's also uh, the co-managing director of Sanford Rose & Associates, which is one of the largest uh, kind of franchise groups in the U.S. for recruiting. So super excited to have uh, Jeff here with us. So, Jeff, welcome. How is everything in your world? It looks like it's a little bit rainy out in, uh, in, in your area right now. Yeah, it's a little overcast, but it's okay. It makes better for lighting for us. So it's good to be with you, Joel. Yeah, it's great. Great to have you. Well, I, I typically start these episodes uh, with just a question of how you got started in the industry. Uh, I love the variety of answers we get. So why don't we start off with that? Why don't you give me a, a quick rundown of how you got started in, in the uh, recruitment industry? Sure. I'll really date myself with this. Uh, but I was uh, attending the University of Texas at Austin, the university that my dad referred to as the bar with the $20,000 cover charge at the time. Now that I have three <laughs> kids, it's more like $120,000 cover charge. I interned in between my sophomore and junior year, getting paid about five bucks an hour to circle names in this directory, which was, I looked at it like I got paid money to date the boss's daughter at the time that I was dating. Um, the next summer I came back and they said, why don't you try this recruiting thing? I did. Uh, I was heading to law school. Fortunately, I tore that application up. I decided the world was not going to mourn one less lawyer in it. But that summer, I did really well. As a matter of fact, I made enough money to buy a new car. And with that, I um, decided that the recruiting was going to be what I was going to do for my life. I graduated in the uh, May of 89. I started June 2nd, which was my 32nd anniversary a few days ago. And I've been loving it, doing it ever since. Well, congratulations on uh, 32 years. It's pretty... Uh... Pretty impressive there. I'd, I'd be curious, uh, you know, I want to get into what's going on right now with the market because I know we're kind of going through a unique time. But um, what would you say, you know, if you were to narrow it down, like one of the biggest differences from today and when you started compared to now and you bring in entry level people into the, the uh, agency recruitment world, what would you say the biggest difference is between now and then when you started? Well, Clearly, technological revolution has changed, and so there's inflection points when you look at it. Um, there was an expression that used to be, um, when I first started, it was the number of calls you made, right? And they actually referred to it as SOD calling, S-O-D, as in spin of the dial. Now, that was even before my time, but I want you to imagine, literally, rotator, rotator phone, spin of the dial. That's an expression that you'll see some people still use to this day. So when I started, it was... Uh, a big objection was send me your resume and you didn't want to do that because you had to mail it. So you could say it went from mail to fax to um, email to job boards to LinkedIn to, you know, artificial intelligence today. All of these are just simply tools of so the technological revol uh, revolution that's allowed recruiters to become more effective. But the thesis that I had 32 years ago, which stands today, is that we're really knowledge brokers. That being an expert in search is one thing, uh, but our market wants us to be an expert within their particular area. So think of it as if a doctor bragged to me and told me they got a medical director, uh, doctorate, I wouldn't think that that would be the criteria for them to want to then operate on me. I'd be like, well, I expected that to be the case. So if you're telling me that you're ethical, hardworking, dedicated, driven, uh, professional that really works in a very... Uh, thorough process, you're, you vet your candidates thoroughly, you've been trained in behavioral interviewing, you really truly understand you know, how to understand a client need, you have a specific you know, 18 point, 12 point, 14 point hiring process. My answer is like, you're basically just reading me the, what's on the portfolio of your JD or your MD. Yep. What I wanna know is how can you specifically uh, separate yourself in this market for me? So I think the one thing that's changed is technology the thing that has not changed is that clients want market masters. They want people to be a specialist in their particular space that can bring them information, insight, specifically as it relates to their specific industry, as it relates to their specific area, their specific function. So I think there's been a lot of changes over many years, t ways of finding candidates, ways of reaching out, ways of communicating, uh, the mediums that we can deliver our message. 
But at the end of the day, the type of message that we deliver, I believe, is what separates us. And the more that you're able to deliver a message that's specific to that market, the better. Yeah, I love that. I, I think that's a massive challenge, you know, for especially coming into the industry. You're obviously you're trying to build up that client list. You're trying to build up those that candidate list, and you're also trying to be an expert in a space that you have you know zero hands-on experience uh, in. So I think it's a massive point. Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the market right now. Obviously, super busy. People are, are hiring left and right. Um, how, how are you guys you know, coping with the, the change in the market over the last year? Obviously, we kind of went from things being so unknown. It seems like everybody's hiring right now. So how are you guys handling which job orders to take, which clients to work with? How, how are you managing that within, uh, within your team? Yeah, great question, Joel. So think of the market as just one big basic supply and demand, and it's a pendulum that swings, right? So a year ago, candidate, uh, excuse me, employer-driven market. A year before that, candidate-driven market. Now, candidate-driven market again. You can go back over those 30 years and look at inflection points of when it was very candidate-driven and when it's very employer-driven. The more that it's employer driven, um, obviously, the more that you'll see challenge with getting quantity of quality searches and finding companies willing to utilize you and willing to pay for your services and companies that are more discerning and more um, uh, careful about who they bring in and who they hire because their hiring is limited. When the pendulum swings the other way, it becomes incredibly candidate driven. And you start seeing all kinds of things that companies are doing to try to attract the best and brightest to theirs versus everything else. To recruiters, what that means is we have to become more creative. We have to become um, uh, better able to identify, evaluate, and help our clients hire the very best talent for their urgent and critical needs. So the more candidate-driven the market, the more difficult it is to find people. This is the thing that I want every headhunter out there to get. That's why you're getting paid. The reason 100%. why they use us is because it's hard. When it's really easy, they don't need to pay you 10 or 50 or $100,000 to find a human being. They can go do it themselves. So ultimately, what we're finding is the harder it gets to identify and attract the right people, candidly, once again, the more it is that the generalist doesn't have the ability to ultimately fulfill those needs. So a specialist, and by the way, go one step further, a specialist who works in a recyclable market probably gets to a certain point where they know most of the players in that particular market. So the greater the level of knowledge that you have in a market, the greater level of awareness you have of who all the players are, that increases your ability to identify who's the right fit, to know the players well enough to know who to reach out to, and to understand and have solid enough relationships with the people to help them effectively navigate through that process. So today, I think the greatest thing that you'll find is that it will be more and more difficult to get people to communicate with you because they're being bombarded with a million messages from texting and phone calls and emails and LinkedIn's and everything else uh, to create the right differentiation of message will be the, what separates the great recruiters from getting there. And then the people that truly understand the market that are reaching out to the right people for the right career enhancing opportunities. I think that's really where it's uh, gonna separate uh, individuals because it is more candidate driven. And by the way, it's going to get more candidate driven not less. Have you ever seen a, a, a market that's more candidate driven than this in, in your experience? Have I seen a market that's more candidate driven than this? Um, again, I'll have to date myself. <laughs> uh, if you were in the dot com bubble of the late 90s and you were in that particular world at that time period, there were a lot of individuals that were technology recruiters that were making money hand over fist that thought the, you know, the parade would never end and then came uh, 2000 when the bubble burst and then 9-11, of course, and that yeah. one-two punch uh, sent a lot of individuals that thought their market would never change into a really different tune. So I've seen markets ebb and uh, flow over time periods. I think this is absolutely uh, an example of one of those candidate-driven marketplaces, but I'd say it's right now about on par with what I've seen it a couple of times before. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I... Every single person I'm talking to, whether it's a recruitment agency owner, whether it's someone who's working as a corporate recruiter, everybody is really, really busy. So one of the things you mentioned then, though, was about the differentiation of your message. So what does that break? I mean, with with all the ways that we can reach out to people, with the calls, with text, with email, how, like, in your mind, what is 
a good example or how do you differentiate your message to really impact people and, and get past all the noise that's out there right now? Yeah, so let's break down recruiting into three buckets, right? Data, that's who I'm going after. Engagement, that's what I'm going to communicate, which is your question. And then persuasion, which is once I've gotten to the right individuals, what am I going to do to persuade them um, for something that's good for them, in my opinion? Um, so the message is one part of the engagement and one part of the persuasion. Again, the more that you know the particular market, the more the right uh, inform uh, data is there, the right people are there that you're going after, the greater your ability to deliver a very compelling message in that market. But think of delivering the message. I'll use this as a, um, I'm Procter & Gamble and I sell toothpaste, right? My Crest division. They don't sit around the table and go, well, you know what? AM radio doesn't work and FM radio doesn't work. And another person says we need to be on TikTok and we need to be on social media. And someone else says, I like advertising on newspapers and billboards. And someone else goes, what about magazines? Someone else says, what about emailing? What about in person? And the other individual reminds everyone, guess what? These are all just different mediums to sell our toothpaste. And we have to go meet the buyer where they are. Some buyers of toothpaste are on AM radio and some are on social media and some are on traditional methods. So we want to communicate with them in a variety of ways that's best able to reach them where they live, not where we think that they live, not yep. where we're going to get 20%, but we're going to get 100% of the market. So let's start with the mediums need to be an all-encompassing strategy, in my opinion, not a what I happen to like is X, so that's where I'll spend my time. The second then is the message. And the more unique that message is, and I'll define unique by its definition means, can someone else send that same message and communicate the same? And then if, if so, then my question is, how is that compelling and differentiating? I'll give you a test. I call it the opposite test. Think of the opposite of what you're saying. And if the opposite of what you're saying is ridiculous, then what you're saying is just occupying time. It's just filling up words and putting up space. So if you ever say, you know, I'm a hardworking, diligent, um, high integrity, great communication skills, a driven person. Does anyone ever say I have low integrity, <laughs> low work ethic, no drive, no ambition. I'm not have a poor attitude. I don't work well in a team. So when you say those things, they're just filling up words. So if you say my client is looking for a dr driven, self-starting individual who has you know, an incredible ability to be able to, you know, see the big picture and have great vision, someone that can solve complex and challenging problems. Does anyone want someone who doesn't have the ability to solve complex and challenging problems? No. So now ask yourself, what does that look like? And the answer is, tell me the market that you're in and I'll tell you the content because the content should be very market specific. Whatever that particular person does, that's where the message should be. You know, most group life underwriters that I speak with want X. Most, you know, consumer product brand managers that specifically work only in the market research department doing data analytics specifically for these type of consumer products, I have found want the following. Whatever that particular niche focus is, the, you know, commercial uh, banking loan officers that I work with across North Carolina all feel the following way. Start with that framing of that message. And then the more specific that your message can be in that marketplace is to why, if it's a recruiting message, why would a candidate want to speak with you? What is it that you bring that would have that individual? Is it a specific position? Is it a specific piece of information in the market? Or are you just a person that they should want to speak with? And if so, what's the compelling reason of why you? Why you versus the other 100 emails, in-mails, voicemails, text messages, phone calls? Why is yours the one that they should return versus anybody else's? And if what other people could say is the same thing you're saying, it by very definition doesn't meet the standard of what I would say, which is compelling and differentiating, which is very specific that only someone who works in that particular niche would be able to communicate. I love it. I love it. And I, I think, you know, one of the challenges is, right, like you have automation, we got a lot of tech tools, which are great, which make things easier. But I think the point of like that hyper personalization, the specialization, that can be that can be a real uh, real game changer, you know, in terms of getting a hold of people. Um, so when you're bringing when you're bringing new people on board, um, I know you're huge in, in in the training. So in terms of bringing people on board, have you had to to bring people on board remotely? How how has that impacted how you bring people on board, and how has training changed, and how? Are you recommending, like, as you bring people on, 
remote or hybrid, like how has that changed your approach to, to training and how have you guys been adapting with, with uh, those changes? Great. So, I mean, you probably know about 2008, we started Next Level Exchange. So in addition to Cape Austin and Stanford Rose Associates, Next Level Exchange is a platform for recruiting, elevating the competencies of recruiting professionals all over the world. And as a result, our reputation as an industry. So delivering distance-based recruiting training content is something that we've been doing for you know, 13, 14 years. Specifically to us, when it, uh, so how we adapted to the environment was obviously everyone had to go uh, virtual immediately. Um, and I think what you'll find, so I'm gonna answer it two ways. One, distance-based learning, which is what's happening right now, is something that's been going on for a long time. And I think that's actually one of the greatest opportunities that's out there is that individuals can now deliver their message across multiple platforms to individuals wanting to learn and grow all over the world. And that is an incredible benefit associated with technology that's become more pervasive as a result of the pandemic in the last you know, 14 months. I think those some organizations were already doing it, so this was normal. I think other individual organizations weren't, and you know they were rushing out, scrambling overnight. What's Zoom? How do I do this? How do I manage in a distance-based environment? How am I going to understand how to track things? Everything else. So I think people either, you know, were forced into a new revolution, whether they wanted it or not. It might have happened eventually, but I think this just accelerated the timeline and created that uh, necessary change. I think what will ultimately happen is when people ask, what, what would you think will occur from it? Yet yeah, some companies will go back to work. Some companies will remain distance based. Some companies will have a hybrid. Some companies will have a policy that's pervasive around the unique individual needs of that candidate. In other words, every company is going to respond differently based on their particular unique culture and their particular organization. But I think actually distance based has created a greater opportunity because now the recruiter and this is going to be moving the cheese once again for the recruiter. So imagine the local recruiter that only works Dallas. Here I am in Dallas, right? So I only work Dallas, and that's all that I do is work this particular market. Let's say I do finance and accounting in Dallas. But all of a sudden, my client says, I'll hire someone in Cleveland. I'll hire him in Seattle. I'll hire him in Omaha. Well, how am I going to now go deliver for my client candidates that are outside of my world? But yet they're willing to hire those people. So ultimately, the ability to um, move at a very fast speed to adjust to the changes needed by a distance-based environment for an individual recruiter, individual organization is, I think, imperative. And being able to accommodate the wants, needs, and desires of every given recruiter is imperative. I also think it's a great opportunity because it's increased the footprint, it's increased the market that companies can hire in. So the one thing that might be a benefit, matter of fact, I'll, not might be, it is a benefit, in this particular war for talent, is that they're the ability to identify people who are not geographically located where the client's position is located has actually created, created an opportunity to expand the footprint, to expand the target audience that you can ultimately recruit for for a lot of positions. So I think that's an actual benefit. So when, uh, I mean, just from like a, a third party agency point, point of view, when you're bringing in new recruiters, obviously the bullpen is traditionally where you would learn, you get to hear tons of conversations. It's got a little bit unpredictable. You have the energy there. Um, how, how are you re recreating that type of atmosphere, that type of learning, the on the spot learning when it comes to your agency? Sure. So, uh, I always dislike it when people start plugging stuff in these things because it annoys <laughs> me. So I'm, I've been trying to Go avoid ahead and plug. That, but you're asking you're, a very specific direct question of exactly a program that we've been doing for over a decade. So Next Level Exchange, which is, again, has a program. Think of it as defensive driving for recruiters. It's 20 hours of video, but there is a program that our team offers called Facilitative Foundation Training that is 16 hours of virtual classroom where recruiters are role playing. They're getting together over a six week time period, engaging in what they're learning. So they're watching the videos. Then they're logging onto a group webinar with 12, 15 other people. And it's, you know, Joel, you're the client. Jeff, you're the candidate. Uh, or the recruiter role play on this, but how do you get past the hyper I'm at objection? How do you ultimately clear a fee? How should you deal with a candidate that says they don't know anyone for the position? And that actual engagement can happen. So to translate that away from our language, I would say any platform like Zoom can allow you to do that. You can ultimately, you know, go watch a, a video of something, go teach a topic related to anything that recruiters deal with. Let's say the number one has got to be what? 
a candidate that says, you know, I'm good, I'm happy where I'm at, doing a good job, not really open to change, thanks very much, you know, talk to you, I'm busy, whatever it is. And what do you do to try to engage that individual in creating that pattern interrupt that says, well, like most ha most people that I deal with, they are happy doing a great job. Matter of fact, that is exactly the type of person my client wants. And the reason specifically why this is something that I suggest that you consider is the following. Okay, whatever that is that I'm gonna now say, and the opening, the closing, the opening, the middle part, and then the closing are things that I need to role play on, right? I need to practice on. So ultimately a perfect setup would be the two of us on this role playing with each other with the coach watching the both of us and then giving us feedback after. This, any, any technological platform, right, that can do that. It's just a matter of, instead of saying, let's all go meet in the conference room at 10 o'clock, it's all go lead, meet in a virtual conference room at 10 o'clock. So I think, um, it's again changing. It's different for some organizations. Some people have been doing this a long time, but I think you can create that warmth, that connectivity, that community utilizing technology in a way that you haven't before. Does that mean that I think it will replace getting together in the conference room and the human need for connection and interaction with one another? No, I think there's a danger associated with people working from home uh, perpetually without being associated with anybody else. I think there's actually a, you know, any positive has inherent drawbacks. There's no such thing. Most problems, um, or so, excuse me, I'll say this. Most issues are not problems to be solved. They're polarities to be managed. So if you see any time a new tool or technology or methodology or approach to training or a way of learning comes up, people are going to point out the negative and my answer is going to be, yes, there are issues with anything. The question is, are there fewer issues with that way and there are better opportunities and better benefits associated with it? And I think distance-based learning is a perfect example of a benefit associated with creating a larger net and a bigger community, utilizing technology to create more learning in a way that's still very high touch and interactive. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, to me, like the, high, the hybrid model is, is what I'm a huge fan of and just people being able to have the freedom to work wherever they want as long as they're getting the results they have. But I think right now, obviously it's popular just to say remote work forever and, and a lot of people, you know, on LinkedIn in particular, there's a lot of, of people who are putting out posts saying, if you're not offering just purely remote work, you're gonna lose out on people. Um, but we're, we're kind of overlooking the mental health, we're overlooking uh, the capabilities of what happens when people get together. There's, there is just something that happens when people are together. Um, I'm, I'm also curious, you know, in terms of, um, you know, just people who are newer into the industry, obviously it's a, a unique time to be in the industry. I think turnover has been an issue in, in staffing and recruitment. So how are you bringing people on and onboarding in terms of increasing turnover for that, you know, in that first couple of years? And, and how are you motivating people in, in different ways? Like what are, what are some of the things that you're doing to, to increase turnover, sorry, increase uh, retention for particularly entry level people into the industry? So, uh, I'll give you this stat. We have just under 100 people in our company. Uh, 38 or roughly 40% of our office has been here over a decade. We started a thing called the Decade Club in 2010, which meant once you crossed over 10 years, you would join that club. We have 100% retention of that club for the last 11 years, which means we've lost zero people that have been here over a decade. I share that because that defies the narrative that's out there, which says there's this incredibly high turnover. I believe there is, but I believe there is for something I'll just say that might shock some people, but the job of being a recruiter sucks. Let me repeat that. The job of being a recruiter <laughs> sucks. It's a terrible job. Nobody ever says, gosh, I can't wait. I'm going to call a bunch of people that I don't know in an industry that I have no experience in, utilizing some ATS that I've never worked on before, utilizing a bunch of tools I've never known how to use before, and I'm going to get out there and call a bunch of people that don't want to talk to me because I have no experience. What an awesome job. No, it sucks. The career of being a recruiter is the best career, in my opinion, that there is out there. Where else do we have the ability to be able to control your own destiny, build a book of business, have your business go where you go, um, have the benefit associated with impacting companies and building careers? Think about that. We're literally building companies, we do it, we're impacting people's careers, and we can do it absolutely anywhere in the world, and our success is only limited by our own ability. It's a pure meritocracy. But in order to get to the career, in order to get to the career of a search professional, you have to go through the gauntlet of the crappy job. Well, most, let's say, cardiothoracic surgeons that you would talk to don't say, oh my God, do I love stitching up the drunk college kid that decided to do a keg stand at midnight on a Saturday night? But I'm willing to do that for the career. Most 
uh, lawyers don't like, I can't wait to go study and read a thousand briefs. I want to go to law school to be a litigator. Yeah, but in order to go into the courtroom and litigate, you had to go through three years of law school, which no one thought was great, then go through a few years of being an associate uh, doing that work in order to get to that place. Well, here's the beautiful thing. Unlike being humming a lawyer, unlike becoming a doctor, unlike so many other professions that require a PhD program, think of the amount of work that you have to do in the, quote, job portion of that life. A recruiter might have six months to 18. I would say six to 12 months, six to 18 months. If recruiters enter this profession saying, I work for myself, I'm an entrepreneur, and I want to come here and ultimately learn how to build my craft and ultimately, hopefully, your book of business within the walls of the organization that you're at. And the owners of that company work for you, not the other way around. The people running around my office right now, they're called my clients. My job is to serve them, provide a great culture, great uh, career path, wonderful compensation plan, great uh, internal infrastructure, systems, career paths, and roles that allow people to ultimately build whatever they want within these walls as opposed to having to leave and go on their own, which is why 25,000 search firms exist, 90% of them started by someone quitting to go on their own. So instead of hiring and treating people like employees, how about hire and treat people like entrepreneurs who are going to build their own businesses within your walls. And if you can show them a career path that says, here's the crappy job, come willing to do the job in order to get to the career path, then I believe we can uh, have a pattern interrupt over that perpetual turnover. It doesn't mean that some people won't come here and say, I don't love the job. And I also see the vision of the career and I don't think this is right for me. Great. The best thing you can do is leave. Matter of fact, the best thing you can do, figure that out in the first month and take off or figure out a way of doing the work that's necessary, not for someone else. You're not coming in early or staying late for someone. You're doing it for yourself. And I say this with love and affection to all fellow owners out there. But if your environment doesn't invite a benefit associated with doing that, and you're an employee-oriented mindset, then sometimes that's what's going to happen. And that's just the nature of the beast. Turnover is going to be there. That's the nature of what it looks like. And that's the nature of what it looks like in organizations that don't, in my opinion, promote a more entrepreneurial culture that people are building their books of business. Nobody goes to a real estate agent and says, God, why are you working on the weekends? That seems so terrible. Well, I get to work on the weekends. I don't have to. I get to work at night if I want to. That's what a real estate broker, a private wealth management advisor, an insurance broker, anybody that views it as they're building their book of business, their career, their business, they're an entrepreneur. If you look at it like you have a job, and you start asking questions like, what are the hours and what are the benefits? Then your starting framing comes from an employee-oriented mindset. Nothing wrong with that. You've decided to just take, go to a company and have a job. I hope you do a good job. You get promoted. You'll get a benefit, a raise. You'll quit. You'll go to another job in a few years or take another job in a few years. And ultimately, you have five, six jobs in 10 years. And that's cool these days because nobody cares. But the impact is, how are you growing professionally? How amazing would it be to know that the place that you're at right now with the people that you're working with, you get to go to work every single day doing work you love, but you get to do it with people that you love. And the people that you're doing it with today are going to be not just friends for the next year or two, and you're going to go out to have beers with them on happy hour and then never see them again. They're going to be people that are going to watch your family grow up, to watch your kids grow up, and you're going to do that. Well, in order to create that environment, you got to get out from the mindset that recruiting is a job. Because if it is, again, it will suck. But the career, oh my goodness. What an amazing career uh, that um, once you are able to write your own ticket, develop your own success, build your own um, market mastery and have that level of gravitas, that level of expertise within a particular immunity to be seen as a subject matter expert, a valued market insider in your marketplace where clients and candidates value you, they value your opinion as an industry expert and then they're willing to pay you very well for that expertise and your business can go anywhere in the world that you want it to go and you get to do that with people that you love doing it with in an impact to help build companies and impact careers what could be better but the job sucks <laughs> no i love i love it man and it's, it's, it's spot on and it's uh you know, I know Frank here as well i'll just flash this on the screen Frank just said preach it jeff amen and and i think um obviously I, I don't know whether we covered the stat, but is it like 90% of recruitment agencies are under 15 people or it's, it's, it's some sort of stat out there that that's like that. Um, so obviously the fact that you've built such a large group in one location speaks for itself and, and most companies don't get to that. So I, I, you, I know you kind of touched upon it, but what do you see 
Um, is it just when people start off their agency, they're, they're wanting to come from a place of like quitting another agency and wanting just to take the, you know, the full commission? Like what, where do you, th why do you think it's so hard to, to scale uh, for 90% of the agencies that are out there? And what, what would you say? Is it just that foundational mindset or is it their own hiring? Like what, what's the root cause issue with that? Yeah, that's a great question, Joel. I mean, I would, I can't give you the stat. I, I, I would say 90% of all firms, but then 72% of all statistics are made up on the spot. So you got to be careful with that. I think about 90% of all search firms were started by someone quitting someone else's business. And they say things like this, you know, I've always envisioned myself as a business. I always wanted to have my own business. I've always been kind of an entrepreneur. And I really thought to myself that maybe doing it myself was always a vision. Let me translate that. Hey man, you're only paying me 40, 50%. I bill 400,000. You're taking 200. What am I getting for my 200? Well, I have a great culture. So that's 200 grand. Well, look at all these benefits and I pay for your ATS and your career and I pay for FICA and suit and food and your healthcare. But okay, all that $30,000 a year, $40,000 a year. Okay, good. So you paid me 50%. That's 200 grand plus another 40 grand is 240. I still did 400. I'm giving up 160 grand. What am I getting for that? The culture? Yeah. So that ultimately is a fundamental flaw in the dynamic of our business that has not thought beyond stage one of let me quit start my own firm then what happens is they quit there i'm going to do it differently and they're going to do it differently because they get to be the house then all of a sudden they hire people and they're going to get more work they can handle so i'll hire someone to help me recruit on it then i'll hire another person to help me recruit on it then let me they'll get their own job orders the next thing you know we'll build this little team then i'll be the one that gets to keep the 100 percent of mine plus the 50 percent of someone else's and i'll pay for all their stuff and i'll make money on it and then until they quit and start their own firm and it's this insanity right as opposed to recognizing that there must be something fundamentally flawed in a model where 24, 5,000, 30,000 search firms exist and the average one is two or three people, where we're 100 people and thought of as this giant. Well, I got news for you. Deco, Man, uh, Manpower, Ronstadt, Kelly, K-Force, those are on the staffing world. They're beasts. They got huge. Corn Ferry, Spencer Stewart, Hydrogen Struggle, Zegon Zenner, Russell Reynolds, all those are beasts on the retain world. This mid-world this contingent, somewhat retained, hybrid, usually permanent, little bit of interim, somewhere between the 60 and $200,000 job, works at the 25 to 30% of fee. That whole world, the it does it either by functionally accounting and finance, IT engineering local, or they do it by agriculture, pharmaceutical, construction, banking, insurance, whatever it is. That wild, wild west is because the search firm owners, and I say this with respect and love because there's 160 of them in our SRA network, We've scaled and grown it beyond our wildest imagination. And that is literally what we do. Help search firm owners build, scale, and grow the businesses that they want, not the ones that we want. And the number one thing that I've seen is that the vast majority of search firm owners weren't really a person wanting to go start and build a search firm. They were a recruiter who quit to go get a larger percentage, found themselves in a situation. Many of them are lifestyle recruiters. That's all they want to do is make money. At some point, they go, I'm a hamster on a wheel, get a job, get a candidate, put them together, make a match, collect a check. And that's great for a couple of years, but after 15 years or 27 years, that doesn't seem like the greatest thing for me. I want to now build something. Where do I go? Where's the McKinsey to help me build, scale, and grow my business? Where's the organizational design, the compensation structures, the career paths that are needed, et cetera, for our industry? And ultimately, until you get your hands around what they are, because they are there. Just like you can learn how to get past your hyper and mad objection, you can learn how to sell a retainer. I promise you, there are best practices for building, scaling, and growing a search firm, but you're going to ultimately have to find them from outside people that understand how to build, scale, and grow um, search firms and have that, and then have the desire to want to do that. And final point to that is the willingness to invest your capital in doing it. Here's the hilarious, I say this like funny, but it's, it's a bit cynical. A lot of individuals go, you know, if I spend money on something, let's say I use, I'll use you, Joel, I'm going to go spend money with Joel to learn how to utilize, build my brand better on LinkedIn, right? Which is a great investment, right? I'm going to do, no, that's an investment. You're spending money, investing in your business to grow your revenue. Instead, people go, no, I think I'm not going to do that. So what will you do instead? Let's see. You will take dollars. You will then pay taxes on them. You'll get after tax dollars, 60, 70 cents of that. You'll then hand it to a financial advisor and say, go invest this for me. They will then take that money and they will go invest it in businesses probably. Those are called stocks. So what you're saying is I'm willing to invest in businesses, just not mine. Yeah. I'm willing to invest in Procter and Gamble and Google and Apple, and I'll give money to Bank Bank of America, Goldman Sachs. I mean, I'll give money to businesses, just not mine. So if you as a search firm owner view it through the lens of hiring and 
buying tools and buying training and investing in organizational design and investing in programs to scale and grow your business. You are literally providing venture capital to your business. You are the venture capitalist investing in your business to help you build, scale, and grow something that can ultimately generate far more economic benefit from just making a placement or two. You have to be able to sacrifice sometimes the urgent for the critical, and those that are willing to do that, which are far and few between, do build, scale, and grow amazing search firms. But you have to see it that redirecting capital is not an expense, it's an investment into your business that allows you to build, scale, and grow something that you otherwise wouldn't want. That final comment, if you do like being a solo producer and you enjoy being a lifestyle guy and that's all you want, more power to you, honestly, fantastic. If you just wanna be a rainmaker, be the surgeon that hires the nurse, the nurse practitioner, the physician's assistant, the schedule, the coordinator so that you can do the most high dollar surgery activity, that is one of the most profitable models you will ever engage in. But for those crazy uh, nuts that actually wanna build, scale and grow a search business or recruiting business, um, you just got to see it as that a business that is worthy of your capital the way that any outside business as worthy of your time. And ultimately, I think there's a, an incredible opportunity, particularly today, to build some amazing businesses. How, how big is the, you know, in terms of like the community aspect? Because I just think as, as, you know, if you're starting up a business or you're an entrepreneur, you know, a lot of times it can be lonely. How, how much of, of community is built into SRA and how much do you see like that? Just even that just community and being connected to other business leaders that have the same goal? Like how much of an impact do you think that that plays in ultimate success? Well, I think, look, um, we as humans are individuals that crave and need interaction with each other. Recruiters are in the 99th percentile of that. That's why we're in the people business. So for people in the people business to then isolate ourselves from people is kind of like insane, right? Um, it's like someone saying, I'm a technological guru and I don't have any technology. It just, it just would seem opposite. So I think the sense of community is, is vital. I think we all wanna be with people that make us someone better than ourselves. Like I like who I am better when I'm around you, Joel. If, if, if people feel that way, they feel, then they feel a sense of community. And an office, an environment becomes a terrarium. And then the fertilizer, the sunshine, the water that allows those plants to grow are things like learning, things like community, things like social interaction with each other, things like support from one another, which you can get through a medium like this, but not as well, in my opinion, as doing it uh, in person or through a, a place where you can at least get together through a networking event or a social event. And if you have to be in an environment that you're by yourself, what an amazing opportunity to be in business for yourself, but not by yourself. And that really is the tagline of what SRA is all about. Bunch of individuals coming together to create what they otherwise wouldn't be able to do by themselves. Most individual, um, and I'd say this to a recruiter at a firm, and I'd say this to an owner at their firm. Most individuals need resources. They can't get those resources just by themselves. So the community provides the ability to get them. If you and I, I'm, I suck at golf and I don't really like it that much, but if I did, <laughs> I probably could not afford to build my own golf course. Yeah. But you and me and 400 other families could chip in a bunch of money and we could share that golf course. We could share an Olympic sized swimming pool and a gym, everything else. That's what they are, right? A gym is a community where people go and physically exercise. But why don't you just do it yourself? Well, one, it's not as enjoyable. And two, I don't have the million dollars to go build a gym. But me and 600 other people get together. We use it without even having a schedule and we all share those resources. Well, what if we could share a hiring team, a training team, a Marcom team, a tech support team, all of those resources that a search firm needs to be able to build, scale, and grow their business, or that a recruiter needs to be able to build, grow, scale, and grow what he or she wants for their business within the walls of another firm, their desk, their practice, their team, I see it through the exact same lens. The search firm owner's responsibility is to provide those resources internally so that the recruiter, the search professional at their company says, I could go on my own, but why would I want to? I have all of the resources that I need to be able to build what I want here, and I can do it within a incredible community. I can do it within an individual with my peers, and I can build and grow something together with people that ultimately can foster incredible relationships within my lives that, you know, we spend a third of our life sleeping, a third of our life working, and a third of our life outside of work. Take the sleep out, that's a 50-50 proposition. 
the fact that you spend 50% of your life at a job to earn money to then go enjoy the other 50%, in my opinion, that is far too much of our lives wasted on work. But if that 50% of your work is a place that you go, you grow spiritually and personally with people that truly make you a better you, that you love being around, then I would say work is a get to go to work place. It's not a have to go to work environment. And then we're no longer wasting our lives on it. We're doing things that are meaningful of significance and value. We're not working necessarily because you need money. Go insert the name of any billionaire. I don't think they're going to work today because they need another uh, uh, more money. They're doing it because of the sense of significance and meaning. I personally believe that recruiters meaning is derived not so much through the work they do, but the who they do the work with. So the more people that you're around, the more sense of community that you have, the more people that can inspire you to be a better you and bring out the best in you, that to me is what community is all about. And I think it's awesome. I, I'm curious too, because I mean, you were super successful as well, you know, before kind of taking on SRA. So what was like the inspiration behind that? Because obviously it's not a small undertaking to uh, lead an organization. So what was, I guess, what inspired you to do that? And uh, originally like when you made that decision? Yeah, so a great question. Um, the reason why Kay Bassman is a single site search firm is I also want to be a good dad, that life is a, being a decathlete. We can't just, you know, a lot of people can be great in one thing, and then you read a book and realize that there are other parts of their life weren't so good. So to me, you know, financially, spiritually, personally, interpersonally, fa familial, friend-wise, even self-indulgence is one of those areas that I think physically that we all want to balance. So for me, I wanted to be there, personal opinion, just wanted to be there, watch my kids grow up. And I knew if Kay Bassman had 87 offices all throughout the country, I'd be on airplanes uh, for their entire mm -hmm. lives. Well, now they're 26, 29, and 20. And uh, that his dynamic has changed. So Sanford Rose, SRA, now we have 160 offices all over the US, even in uh, Asia, Europe, Canada. Uh, and therefore the ability to be able to go and visit and interact with offices when need be, or go to regional conferences or travel becomes easier for me personally. So in a weird way, it was like Kay Bassman being able to have a bunch of different branches, but rather than having to go and actually plant flags in all these different places, let individual owners own their own firm, let them control their own destiny, let them build whatever businesses they want, and let us just simply provide them with the resources that are necessary and the guidance needed to help them build those businesses within a community and to be able to do that on a national and ultimately international footprint, just part of playing a bigger game and finding the passion that I love. And I think everyone's always in pursuit, pun intended, of their own next level. <laughs> and so to me, you know, doing what we did within K Bassman and then providing an, a vehicle to teach others to do it was next level. And then providing a high touch network of being able to do it on a more in-depth basis with SRA. So interestingly enough, if you think of it, I really have three clients, the internal people at K Bassman, the other people call employees. I don't, I call them my clients. Because uh, if they walk out the door and don't come back, it's not a lot of a business that I have to operate. Um, the next level search firm owners and recruiting people that buy our stuff, our clients, and then SRA owners that are relying on us to help them build their businesses. So it, if a somebody needs help in hiring a great recruiter or training that great recruiter or themselves getting better in something, it doesn't really matter whether they're called a K Bassman person, a Sanford Rose office, or a next level client. They all need the same thing. So the beautiful thing is our team, which we call the next level teams, able to help all them individuals um, grow and build whatever it is that they want through whatever vehicle that it is that they want. And we're kind of agnostic about what that looks like. Yeah, I love it. Well, hey, I'm, I'm, um, I've heard tons and tons and tons of great things too. Obviously, I've, I've been able to connect with uh, several owners within the network and they love being part of the network. So uh, anyone who's out there, if you're not connected to, to Jeff, send him a, a LinkedIn uh, request. I would recommend not messaging him <laughs> through, through LinkedIn, uh, but definitely, you know, just find out about SRA as well, especially if you're out there and you're, you know, if you're relatively new in the business and you just started your own firm, or if you've been going for a while and you are looking to scale, because I, I do really believe in, in what Jeff's saying here as well. Uh, so, so get a hold of him. I know we're running out of time here, so I just wanted to, to leave it with this last question that I always ask. And this is kind of going back to, you know, people who are just starting in the industry, particularly those that are maybe at that point that you described, like six months to 18 months in, where they're maybe not feeling like they're getting ahead and they're wondering how long this journey is going to be. If you could just speak to those people specifically, what would be one piece of encouragement or motivation that you would give them uh, to just keep pushing through so they can hit that 
kind of career turning point that you mentioned earlier, what would be that, that piece of advice that you'd give? I would say you got to find joy and love and passion. You got to find your why. So a, uh, I'll, I'll credit the person that wrote the book on it, Kent Burns, a great buddy, friend of mine, also an SRA, wrote a book called What Is Your Why? Me, that's it. You find what your why is. A lot of people dig deep. Well, my kids, I want to provide them a sense of a good college. Now I'll dig deeper. What's your sense of purpose, your sense of significance, your sense of meaning? Why do you want to climb that mountain? What's the motivation behind it? When you have your why, then you'll do almost any how or what in order to achieve that. If this is not something that you're passionate about, which will sound crazy, and I'd say this to anyone in our organization, anyone out there, if you go every single work and you have to go to work every day because it sucks, ultimately find something where you don't. Find something where you can, even if you don't love the today's work. Joel, my advice, if you see the vision, if you see what you want, if you see that the work that you're willing to do today is to get you in pursuit of your why and give you that sense of meaning and significance and contribution that will allow you to provide for those loved ones, the people that give you your, 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 your sense of purpose and your sense of meaning, whoever that might be or whatever that might be, to me, hold on to that and use it as a motivation for the day. Not everybody wants to go into the gym that day, but they hold on to what they want to accomplish, and then they're willing to do the thing that day that they don't want to do to get through it because of it. So my advice for anyone that's in that boat, man, stick with it. Don't give up. Persist. The only way over an obstacle is through it. But I would tell you that if you want to, the, the cliche of working harder, not uh, the working smarter, not harder, it's actually real in our industry. I could not more strongly recommend you, and I'll send you this link later, Joel, but if you want to, I think it's at, it's free. It's at joinsranetwork.com. You go to download my blueprint, and there is a video that I did called Market Mastery. I could not more, I have a lot less gray hair 10 years ago, <laughs> but it is literally how I've built 32 year career. It's what I teach every single recruiter, and it's my advice. Go be a dominant expert within a specific niche. That's how your life will get easier. Because once you're the individual that knows the players, that knows the market, that knows the industry, your life will get easier. For those individuals that have a market that's so big they can't get their hands around, it becomes deflating. So my advice for you is pick a smaller niche, function, industry, location, level within your organization. Figure out a way of dominating that niche. Figure out a way of being the expert. Brand yourself with Joel on LinkedIn as the expert in that space and your life gets easier and better and you can make more money, work less hard with more meaningful, significant work, providing purpose, meaning, and significance to those that you care about. What better could it be? But if you just keep being the hamster on the wheel, doing the job in a world that doesn't allow you to become an expert over anything, it's going to, you're going to, you want the same result, just keep doing what you're getting. But if you want something better, learn, grow, add a little bit every day, get a little bit better each day, Try to connect to that purpose and try to connect to that meaning. Don't give up on yourself. Don't give up on the work, but definitely try to work a little bit smarter along the way too. It's not just work harder. I love it. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to put that link for anyone who's listening afterward. I'm going to put this uh, whole live session on uh, the featured part of my profile on LinkedIn. So you'll be able to go view it. And then we'll also put the link on, on the podcast as well. Once we repurpose it. Uh, but I love that advice. I love how passionate you are for the industry. It's no uh, no mystery why you've, you've been so successful and, and why people love being a part of the SRA network as well. Uh, so I'm going to put links for Next Level Exchange, SRA, and Kay Bassman as well. But Jeff, it's been an honor. I really appreciate your time. And again, if you're out there and you're not following Jeff, just go to his profile and hit follow and uh, and definitely... Um, check out the free resources too that we're gonna we're gonna post and uh, appreciate it and hopefully you get the only thing I, I'm hoping for you right now is you get some more sunshine in the background there because it just it looks a little bit gloomy. Right, hook and we're in Texas. We'll get better. <laughs> it will get better, no doubt. Well, Jeff, I appreciate it and everyone who's out there as well. I know we had Rima, Michelle, Frank, uh, Gabriel, and and Brian. Great to see you guys as well. And anyone who's tuning in afterward. If you want to find out more information as well, you can connect with me and DM me and I'll be able to uh, put you uh, in the right direction as well and and, uh, and get those links to you. So again, Jeff, appreciate it and have a good rest of the day. And I'm going to end this broadcast right now.